thinking about giving a talk on the topic, is there intelligence in the universe? And then I realized, is there intelligence anywhere? Is there intelligence here on earth? So what I plan to do in the talk is just spend a little bit of time talking about intelligence on earth, because I think we have to cover that. And then we'll move on to intelligence beyond the earth. And the definition of intelligence I found in the Oxford English, the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. And uh, I don't think we have a great ability to do that, as you will see. Let's start, I have three examples. Let's start with Genesis uh, 128. I'm sure you're all familiar with your Bible, just in case you're not. And it says here in 128, God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. Well, we surely did it, did a good job. When I was born in 1932, there were 2 billion people on earth. And uh, now uh, I expect, um, <clears throat> I don't think I'm gonna be living to 2050, but uh, for those of you who do live to 2050, it looks like there'll be nine and a half billion people on earth. And this causes tremendous stress. People just don't allow themselves to starve to death. I now created what I call a Genesis 128.1. And it, after the population growth curve has tended towards the vertical, you have completed your task. Now you can rest. Uh, I don't think too many people are listening to that. If you remember the movie, The Graduate, when Mr. Um, McGuire says to the graduate, Dustin Hoffman, Benjamin, he says, Benjamin, I have one word for you. Plastics, that's the future. Our planet is drowning in plastic. And the production of plastic is slowly growing every year by year. My last date is 2019. And we all know about the Saragossa Sea. It's natural seaweed, thousands of miles in, in uh, dimension, natural. But now we have what's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, twice the size of Texas, off the coast of the United States. Now, I suggest that you avert your eyes before you open them completely for the next slide. That is just disgusting. That's the garbage patch. Seabirds, fish, eat it, eat the material, the, the small material. There's this process of communication, communication, I mean, where the big pieces uh, slowly hit other pieces and break into small pieces and become sizes that you can swallow. Uh, I just found along the way, remember, I'm sure many of you have seen the great wave of Kananagua, Japanese woodcut. It's been reinterpreted as the great garbage wave, mostly plastics. Plastics are everywhere. Uh, there are other ocean gyres. There's a, the, certainly this one over here, the East Pacific gyre. Lots of gyres. These are natural whirlpools. And at least they collect the garbage and keep it together. But uh, it's kind of sad. Moving on to the a third and last issue is the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You can see it's monotonic, it's growing. It doesn't look like its curve is bending over. And we all know what that means, the greenhouse effect, increasing temperature. And there's the global uh, surface temperature going up and up. And uh, a worry. And it manifests itself in this Manhattan sized iceberg that broke off from the front glacier this February. It's going to melt. There'll be a sort of a micro increase in sea level, which should take a lot of uh, many uh, micro increases, and it's going to be substantial. So, what I learned from this is at least what I learned is don't buy shorefront property. So I conclude from these three examples personally that the intelligent life on Earth is harmful to the planet 
and to us the inhabitants. And moving on along now, the biological definition of life, I think it's, we should show what this is. It's the capacity to grow, metabolize, and metabolize, respond to stimuli, adapt, and reproduce. And I just wanted to show this gentleman here, Savante Arrhenius. He came up with a theory. He was a uh, Swedish physicist, Nobel Prize winner in 1903 for his work on chemical reactions. And he developed what was called the panspermia theory. And uh, he published his paper in 1903. And he believes, believed uh, that life exists throughout the universe. And it was distributed through the universe via space dust, meteoroids, asteroids, comets, and planetoids. Uh, it has been found um, not to be, it's, it's a phenomenon, panspermia is a theory, but in practice, uh, it's probably will not result in the distribution of life because of the harmful uh, environment of space, 2.7 degrees Kelvin, you have all that uh, UV X, -radi X radiation uh, be very harmful for any life. So that's sort of been knocked down. Then there's uh, Tommy Gold, Thomas Gold. I happened to meet him uh, about 1960. He was a consultant to a lab where I was working. And uh, he developed, probably jocularly, the cosmic garbage theory whereby extraterrestrial space travelers have visited here a long time ago and uh, they left their waste and voila, we're here. The problem with uh, Arrhenius is, and uh, Gold's ideas, they don't answer the question of life. They merely push it on to another celestial body. So let's try to now dig in on that. I mentioned James Jeans at the beginning. Uh, I really was interested. I really liked reading his book as a young man. He went on to uh, do significant work in cosmology. He was knighted. And in addition to the mysterious universe, he wrote Through Space and Time, another popular book, and Stars in Their Courses, and a few others. I'd like to now mention along the way, Thomas Huxley. Uh, he did work in comparative uh, anatomy. Uh, he was very interested in uh, uh, apes, and uh, of which we are the class, we are included in a class of apes. And if you've been in recent times to the Museum of Comparative Zoology on Actress Street at Harvard, they have a wonderful exhibit of uh, the various apes. I recognize my brothers. He was called Darwin's Bulldog because he early on accepted what Darwin was, was thinking, the evolution. And he came up with the six monkeys theorem. Six monkeys strumming unintelligently on six typewriters for millions of years. You really wonder how you can get typewriters to last for millions of years, but let's put that aside for a moment. They will eventually type all the books in the British Museum. Here he is. His five companions are on a thousand year coffee break. And uh, he is looking startled because he just typed a few words. And he's going to go on to type all of Shakespeare. In talking about life in space, intelligence in space, we have to just think about the power of random processes and unimaginable lengths of time. It's something you got to put into your head, if you can. For me personally, I'm sitting here today with you because I'm at the end of a semi-infinite number of coin flips. That's why I'm here. There's the coin. I don't know how it's gonna come down. If it doesn't come down right, who knows about tomorrow? Moving along, I'm gonna talk about two gentlemen. One a Soviet, Alexander Oparin, and he did work on cosmology. And I call it Soviet soup. His theory of primordial soup, that the earth was in this soup material and from it, life arose. 
and he published his pamphlet in 1924, The Origin of Life. The problem was it stayed in the Soviet Union. The country was all buttoned up. It was after the Civil War. Nothing was getting out. So his theory stayed at home. Another gentleman, a Brit named Haldane, came up with a similar theory independently. He had no idea that Oprin, of Oprin's work. I call it British soup. And he in, independently postulated his primordial soup and he called it the origin of life. And now we have what's called the Oprin and Haldane hypothesis. And that hypothesis is of this global soup from which life arose. This idea was tested by Miller and Urey. Miller was a chemist who worked in Harold Urey's lab at the University of Chicago. And how did they test it? And this is Miller. I should show you Miller first. This is Urey. He was a Nobel Prize winner at the time. And here's the apparatus. You notice they have a bottle in which they have uh, water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. They spark it, they heat it, and he ran his apparatus for 30 days. And at the end of the 30 days, they were able to establish that you could take simple chemicals and create inorganic materials. Or, excuse me, you can create complex hydrocarbons from inorganic materials. And if you have hydrocarbons, carbon is the basis of life, the next step might come. You might get that spark where these hydrocarbons can now reproduce. At the end of the 30 days, he did not create life. And the problem was he had to run the, opera, the apparatus, I believe, for 30 million years. Let's, moving along now, is there intelligent life beyond Earth? Just think of what has gone in the past. We're just sort of setting up exercises to get to this point. The search for, ext for extraterrestrial life began in 1959 by these two gentlemen, Giuseppe Cacconi and Philip Morrison, who were at Cornell at the time. And they published, I guess you would call it a seminal paper, in which they made two statements, which seem rather obvious, uh, near some star, like our sun, there are civilizations with scientific interest. In other words, there's cogent life out there. And to these beings, our sun must appear like a likely site for evolution of a new society. They can talk to us. We could even talk to them. And then they decided, where do you look? And this is where you might say uh, <clears throat> the whole idea of SETI began. They chose the frequency of uh, 1.4 gigahertz, 21 centimeter line. It's the emission of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. And to them, it was a logical landmark in the radio spectrum. And here's a radio telescope. You've seen this once before. And here is the a microwave window. And you can see why 21 centimeters is very attractive. Over here, you can see where the galactic noise is diminishing and atmospheric absorption is diminished. So this is a great window. Hydrogen is the place to look. My previous audience was not as sophisticated as you people are, so I'm gonna pass over this very quickly. I wanted to show them where microwaves uh, <clears throat> are relative to uh, visible light. And the conclusion of Caponi and Morrison is, again, obvious, the probability of success is difficult to estimate, but if we never search, the success, the chance of success is zero. I happened to read a number of years ago in Fly Astronomy News, an article in which they had uh, two giants of the world of science argued about SETI. Did it have a chance of succeeding? 
the background in SETI. SETI believers tend to be physicists, chemists, astronomers, mathematicians. The non-believers are evolutionary biologists. And uh, I hope I will demonstrate both groups. SETI has been on a funding roller coaster. In 1975, NASA funded the designs. Proxmire awarded his golden fleece. By 81, it was killed. NASA endorsed the program again in 1988. Congress slated it in 1993. And I have read there might be some money put back in SETI. But SETI has not died. There has been much uh, expenditure by private organizations, a lot of individuals. One, one individual has spent a lot of money on this, as I'll show you later on, is Paul Allen, who was second to Bill Gates. That'll come later. Now, the question is, can SETI succeed? And this was the debate, the two giants being Carl Sagan and Ernst Meyer. And we all know Carl Sagan. Ernst Meyer might not be known to many, but I hope I'll tell you a little bit about him. Well, Carl Sagan would talk about the abundance of life-bearing planets, something he believed. And he was using the what called the meteorocracy principle. And can SETI succeed? Not likely. This is what Ernst Meyer and his hypothesis, he uses the Earth hypothesis. And I'm going to demonstrate both now. We all know Sagan from his television show, Cosmos. Unfortunately, he died much too prematurely. Uh, in his lifetime, he advised NASA on the Viking mission, discovered the high temperature of the planet Venus, investigated atmospheres of Venus, Jupiter, uh, the green wave on Mars. And uh, as we all know, he was an author, science popularizer, science communicator, and somebody who firmly believed that there is life, intelligent life in the universe. And his thinking on the subject is half the nearby sun-like stars have disks of gas. There are 4,000 exoplanets. He be, it's not unreasonable to think that one or two blue worlds around every sun-like uh, star Life, he believed, uh, probably rose as soon as conditions permitted. I don't really know what that means. Uh, there are functional equivalents to humans, maybe not humans, but functional equivalents. And uh, it's better to be smart than stupid in his evolutionary process. You go from stupid to smart. And in conclusion, um, he believed that any long life civilization would have to develop a technology to deal with near earth objects that might destroy their civilization. Uh, he does write that uh, proponents of SETI include biologists, but they're not evolutionary biologists. And of course, no argument can substitute for observational program. What we come down to is you certainly need observation, but how much dollars you put into these programs. He also created a petition and he got signed by many, many scientists around the world. At the time, the center of radio physics and space was his institute at Cornell. And uh, he urged the organization of a coordinated worldwide and systematic search for extraterrestrial intelligence. He was always pushing. And his principle, the properties and evolution of the solar system are not unusual in any important way, we're average. Consequently, the processes on earth that led to life and eventually to thinking beings could have occurred throughout the cosmos. That's the principle. And this idea was promoted by Frank Drake and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, his equation. I'll run through that. 
uh, Frank Drake is, was the director of uh, Green Bank Obs Radio Observatory in West Virginia. There's his equation on the board and let's expand it. Here is the Drake equation expanded. I'll go through very quickly the elements of it. I have a problem. I mean, the equation itself is very simple, but I think there's a logical issue in it that the people who work in this field have not recognized. I've written to two SETI investigators and I guess I shouldn't be surprised they never heard back from them. And if any of you folks out there in my li listening audience are interested in the Drake equation in SETI, uh, I'd like to talk to you about it. And you'll have my, you have my email address and maybe we can do something following this meeting. Let's go through the uh, elements of the equation. Well, this is what we're looking for, the number of advanced civilizations. And Drake, uh, first, uh, in building it up, you have to have uh, some idea of what the average rate of star, star formation is. And that number is about three per year. So that's something that's known. The fraction of, of these stars that have planets, by this time we can make an, a, a reasonable guess. The number of planets that can support life, well, you know, you have to be in what's called the Goldilocks zone. You can't be too close to your star. You can't be too far away. So it is probably a zone and some of these planets do have a, a zone of life which can support life. We now get spongier and spongier. What is the fraction of planets that can develop life? That's a swag. The fraction of planets that can develop civilizations, another swag. And a fraction of civilizations that could send and receive electromagnetic signals. Right now, we only know one. And an important part of this equation is the length of time the civilizations can send signals. And if you look on the internet, you can see where uh, some people have tried to quanti quantify uh, this equation, which is very interesting to read, but uh, somewhat meaningless. Well, as <clears throat> the, the whole idea of random processes, uh, the Milky Way is a mighty big place. And lots of things can be happening in these 400 billion stars. But the big problem is the Milky Way is so large, it's 200,000 light years away. Even if there is intelligent life out there, and let's say they're a thousand light years away, uh, it's gonna be hard to communicate with them. Unless we relax the laws of nature somehow. And we also have a few problems like here on earth to communicate. We have an overpopulation problem. We have overheating, we have slow poisoning. How long are we gonna be around for to receive a signal? Sagan's last words. Let's use our technology to try and actually find answers. He wants to search. And he was talking about it right up to the end, his end. What are the search tools that were available? Well, we have the Allen Array. Paul Allen uh, was Bill Gates' associate. He was second in command, a billionaire in, in his own right. And he created, he put the funds up to create this Allen Telescope Array. Presently, they have 42 dishes. Each dish is 20 foot in diameter. It was originally planned to have uh, 350 of these dishes, but uh, he died too soon. They did not complete their mission, but they still have 42 and they're looking. We have the Parkes Observatory in Australia. This is a 210 foot radio telescope. They were part of the program. I don't know, <clears throat> I don't think any of these observatories except maybe the Allen are full time. Then we had for a brief period of time, the Oak Ridge at Harvard, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, We had the Oak Ridge antenna. It has been dismantled. This is where Frank Drake works. This is uh, 
well, he was director. I can't say he really works there anymore. Uh, it's 328 foot collecting area, the largest in the world. Then we have this very large array in Sirocco, New Mexico. It's 28 82 foot diameter radio telescopes. They operate in the microwave band. The little telescope, 250 feet diameter, is also searching. And we have Big Ear at uh, Ohio State University. Its effective diameter was 173 feet. And uh, most interesting of all, they actually received the signal, 1977. The techie wrote, wow, he received the signal. Problem is, never got another signal. And I found an article on the internet written 40 years later that they believe it was a comedy that produced the signal. So what have we heard in 60 years of listening? Nary a peep. Now let's move along. Can SETI succeed? Not likely. And this is Ernst Meyer and his rare earth hypothesis. This is Dr. Meyer. I happen to be able to, uh, I met him on a few occasions socially. And uh, at the time, he was one of the most prominent evolutionary biologists of the 20th century, the former director of the Harvard Museum of Comparative Zoology, and he was the winner of the Crawford Prize. It's Crawford is spelled right, that's the way the Swedes do it. Double O. It's interesting um, that Nobel did not leave any money for a prize in biology. Probably he flunked biology and was upset. Possibly. So there's no Nobel Prize in biology, in mathematics, and economics, but prizes have been created and they call them Nobel Prizes. They are uh, the same processes, selection processes, and they all have the pot of gold if you win the prize. And what is the rare earth hypothesis? Complexity and development of human intelligence required, and this is important, an improbable combination of biological, astrophysical, and geological events. This is a evolutionary biologist speaking or writing. And again, Maya, evolution never moves in a straight line like a chemical process. Evolutionary pathways resemble a tree with branches and twigs. In preparing the talk, I had not expected to mention, well, I did mention Darwin earlier, his uh, bulldog, Dux Huxley. But here he is uh, as a young man, he probably just got off the boat, uh, the beagle went round the world. And I found in one of his notebooks here, I think, I think, and you can see the beginning of the whole idea of branching and evolution was developed during the voyage. And from this notebook, my theory would give zest to recent and fossil comparative anatomy. And he postulated that life on earth evolved from an ancient species that diverged over time like tree branches from a single trunk. Here's his tree of life. And I just want to show you, um, over here you can see us mammals, whales and chimps and humans. I love what Mark Twain had to say about humans that our creator was so disappointed with the monkey that he created humans. And here we are on the tree. And it's not clear that this necessarily had to be a branch of that tree. 
Fortunately, it was a branch. That's why we're here this morning. Talk about intelligent life on Earth. This is Dr. Meyer's analysis. Life began here 3.8 billion years ago. For 2 billion years, there were only cells without an organized nucleus. Owing to an astonishing event, 1.8 billion years ago, a creature with an organized nucleus developed and could reproduce. From there, we developed multicellular organisms, fungi, plants, animals, and the animals branched out to about 80 lineages. lineages. Only the chordites with their central nervous system led to intelligence. Intelligence life on Earth continued. Only one lineage led to vertebrates. Vertebrates included fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. 20 million years ago, higher intelligence developed in one of the orders of the mammals, the hominids. The elaboration of the brain began about 3 mi million years ago. And his concluding remarks are, he speculates that there have been 50 billion species. Millions of species get along fine without high intelligence. Only one species achieved the intelligence to establish a civilization. Only one civilization developed technology to transmit it into space and received from space. The last word of Ernst Meyer, it can be shown that the success of an observational program is so totally improbable that it can, can be considered zero. He doesn't say it's zero, but it can be considered zero. And you might say that processes on other worlds, unless you believe in a great designer who can truncate the process, has to go through the same steps, the same improbable steps that produce intelligent form of life. <clears throat> How do we communicate with extraterrestrials? Well, doesn't this look mystical? 137, most of you immediately recognize this as a prime number. I'm not getting mystical with you now, but not going to advance from 137. I think you'll all be smiling soon. 137. Signal to aliens our understanding of quantum mechanics. The aliens would know the number if they developed advanced sciences. 137 is the fine structure constant. I, know, I never took a course in atomic physics. So to say it's a measure of uh, how charged particles and photons interact, it's just a statement to me I have never really studied. I take this on faith. That's what the fine structure constant means. And why is it unique? It's dimensionless. There are no uh, centimeters, kilometers, seconds. It's a number. And there it is, the fine structure constant. And it's made up of these elements, and that's its value. And if you take the reciprocal, you get 137. So it's been suggested that we propagate the number 137 in binary form as a binary number, figuring that intelligence in the universe, they will have developed a binary system. You can't be any more, can't be any more basic than binary. And there's 137 in binary. I would, uh, it's been suggested that we just send 137 as an SOS signal, SOS, OS, OS, and the same thing with 137. And maybe somebody is listening. And it's saying we are here and we are intelligent. Lewis Thomas in his book, The Lives of a Cell, made some interesting suggestions as to what is propagated into space. And in his book, 
he talks about contacting extraterrestrials. And he thinks the safest thing to do is to send music. This language may be the best we have for explaining what we are like. And he wants to send Bach into space, all of Bach. And he feels we would be brave. But then he goes on to say, we can tell them the harder truths later. How do we speak with these people? What do we say? Again, this is Thomas. Well, after all, the main question will be the opener. Hello. Are you there? If the reply should turn out to be yes, no. we might want to stop there and think about it for quite a long time. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Rod Serling program, The Serve Mankind, when he finds out it's a cookbook. to serve man, so we're going to have to be very careful in our dialogue with extraterrestrials. They might be so advanced, you can, <clears throat> if there are intelligent civilization <clears throat> out there, you got to figure, <clears throat> half of them are not as smart as we are, but the other half is smart, so we're going to have to be careful. One of the sad conclusions for me, personally, There is no intelligent civilization on Earth. And there's probably no intelligent life beyond our planet. But I'm not done. It's almost the end. You're all familiar with Enrico Fermi. It's, it's a name you all heard of. Uh, he came to the US in the 1930s. The German physicists came to America because they were Jewish. Fermi was an Italian Catholic who came from Italy to America because his wife was Jewish. He knew he had to get out. They had to get out. <clears throat> There's something called the Fermi paradox, which I guess many of you are familiar with. It developed in 1946 and a lunch at Los Salamos is full of large the way it has come to be reported. And present was Fermi, Edward Teller, um, a fellow by the name of Emil Kapazinski, and Herbert York. And at that lunch, they just had a discussion of life on other worlds. And Fermi came up with his paradox. It's the contradiction between the lack of evidence for extraterrestrial civilizations and various high estimates of their probability, which is he converted into just a few words. Where is everybody? What do you think? Are we alone? Do we have company? Really Howard, thanks, thanks so much. I, I think it's uh, you raise a lot of interesting questions, and I suspect there's uh, one or two people here who might uh, have have some interesting things to say about some of the uh, hypotheses you posed. Uh, there was one question in the chat that uh, John alluded to a while ago. There was a, a book written in a movie made called The Martian. He wrote a couple of books, uh, one in the interim, and then his most recent right, three books. One in the interim and uh, the most recent book is called Hail Mary. And uh, I recently read it and it uh, dovetails nicely into your presentation. Uh, Hail Mary is basically the, uh, the title and it talks about a uh, phenomenon that was discovered in, in fiction, of course, of our sun dimming because of an unknown phenomena. This unknown phenomena turned out to be some sort of life form that we didn't know anything about. And the Hail Mary was a mission to try to understand this. 
And so this mission gets sent into space and various things happen and they discover various, various things. The protagonist's uh, basic premise was that the life form was not water-based as we assume most life is. And that's why he was selected to be involved in this particular mission. And it goes on. And most of it's fairly interesting and plausible. Some of it is a little out there and, and hard to understand and visualize. But uh, it's, it's a really interesting and, and well-written story. I think uh, he has potential for movie number two coming along. So we'll see what's going on. And if you want some uh, interesting page turning, I recommend it. And we can stick that in the chat and I can send the, the link to Steve and we can, we can uh, stick it up there. And it has by far the best alien from any book that I've ever read. And I've read a fair, fair amount of science fiction. Anyway, I'm telling you that the correct title of the book is Project Hail Mary. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, but the, the idea of, uh, there's, a, there's a guy named Hal Clement who wrote a series of uh, science fiction books in which... Uh, various extremes uh, of environment uh, will produce other life forms. Uh, for example, he has one called Almost Critical, where the planet, uh, the planet has a, a methane atmosphere uh, that is very close to the critical point of methane. So that some of the times it snows methane, some of the times it rains methane, some of the times it uh, just goes straight to liquid methane. And uh, uh, and then he talk, He tries to imagine life forms that will go with that. Uh, we know that on Earth, uh, at the big smokers, uh, at the great depths of the sea, uh, there are life forms that uh, get their energy from sulfur uh, and not from oxygen. And so, you know, there's a lot of possible chemistries that we don't even understand, uh, barely aware of. Uh, so I would... Uh, and there's also a, another uh, line of argument for uh, intelligence, which says, you know, well, maybe it isn't going to come out of organic chemistry. You know, maybe it will just come out of uh, computers. You know, maybe, um, maybe in inventing the computer, we're inventing the next life form uh, that uh, will be able to take take itself on and uh, reproduce itself. If you watch some uh, of the movies coming out of Hollywood, they've already invented um, robots that can take over. That, of course, is yeah the um, the, uh, the Terminator series, which are all, of course, all part of somebody's campaign to get elected governor of California. Uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, but those those are little yeah. I guess that that's right. Uh, I mean, the whole uh, the whole theory there is that we create this absolutely uh, fabulous uh, computer system which will defend us from nuclear attacks, and then it it realizes that it can take over the world by instigating a nuclear attack, and that's the beginning of the Terminator series. It's also a a major back feature in the Dune series by Frank Herbert, because uh, early. Uh, 50,000 years before the book begins, there are a group of computers that take over things and a worldwide intergalactic battle between them and people and the computers are defeated. And the result is that no more computers are allowed. Uh, and it's a very interesting premise. Of, I, of that series I, I of mean, I've read the Dune series, uh, John. I don't remember the, the backstory. Maybe I haven't read them all. Look up the Butlerian uh, something. I forget what it's called, but that's when the battle was with the uh, computers. Uh -huh. I, I think I've read Dune, Dune Messiah, and that's why everybody uses swords. Yeah, and there's always Hal. Yeah, well, it, it's very interesting that uh, all of us are talking about I uh, about consciousness and sentient computers or sentient machines when no such thing has ever been demonstrated to be possible yet. We don't know how to do it. Well, we, we don't yeah. even understand how it how we are. That's exactly uh, why we can't do it. 
Yeah, but one, you know, one yeah, argument is that if you build something complex enough, it, it'll just happen. And that's yeah. what happened to us. Although we are not the most complex organism on Earth. Uh, okay, but I can live with that. <laughs> what, we're what's only more 75 years into computers. I mean, we're not very far along. So right. if, you, if you take the premise that, uh, you know, a thousand years from now, uh, things will likely change from what they are today, then who knows? Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you spoke to people in 1950 about what they thought computers could do, nobody could assume that you'd have a, a, a cell phone with the, with the power that it has now to talk uh, Ukrainian to, to uh, George. Yeah, who Dick, was the- Dick, who, Dick Tracy did. Yeah, <laughs> who, right. who, was the, who was the famous uh, computer uh, fellow in the early days of the computers who said the whole world would never need more than about two mainframes? Oh, that, that was, was Watson. Watson. And Watson. he said it was seven, I believe. <laughs> IBM, chief of uh, and, and, you know, and taking this, you know, a different way, you can go back to Jules Verne. I mean, you know, how many things did, did he forecast, you know, that, that have come to be? You know, there are, there are, there are you know, people who are strange in, in, you know, in terms of science fiction, in terms of contemporariness. But over time, to John's point, you know, who knows what crazy thing? You know, the, you know, the answer to why may be, in fact, 42. <laughs> I mean, yes, Burns thought that you would get to the moon by shooting a projectile with a gun cotton, with something cotton, you know, gun cotton, I think it was called. Yeah. Well, yep. I mean, it was explosive, you know, and, and you could enough. get to the moon, you could get to the moon that way, but you would be, you'd have to be scraped up out of the inside of the... <laughs> So, I mean, the, the little gelatinous, your little gelatinous remains would have to be scraped up. But there, there are some people who feel that uh, if you get enough uh, good science fiction writers together, that they'll uh, be able to, to tell you what kinds of things you should study, which reminds me, there was a thriller, the, uh, it was turned to a movie with Robert Redford, where they got a whole bunch of people who wrote thrillers, and that's how the CIA came up with ideas. And let's not forget that Star Trek portrayed a lot of stuff that we now have. Yeah, if I can jump in here. Your turn. Uh, yeah. uh, in the, we started out with the question, uh, are we alone in the universe or something like that? But then in the Drake equation, we're talking about radio telescopes, which really has something to do with existence of intelligence but you know uh the question of whether there is somebody that we can one day communicate with and um maybe you could take the sensitivity of these radio telescopes that was presented and figure out you know how much power would need to be uh broadcast from nearby stars certainly probably not even a nearby galaxy you probably you could probably never have anything powerful enough to uh to send out a signal that, that these telescopes could pick up. So, I mean, the, the question is more like, uh, where is the nearest, next nearest uh, intelligent species? Not in my neighborhood. Okay. And that's, that's isn't that part of the same, really the, the same question we all asked, you know, you know, we have, is there, you know, is probably a, a more broad question. And the, if you understand that is there is a maybe, and then where, and that's what people have been looking at, you know, uh, people talking about the Goldilocks region, which may or may not be the right thing to do, and, and some other things. And, you know, at 400 billion stars, you know, we got a few candidates. I mean, the, the, there is a certain parochialism in, th in thinking of life as DNA based and water based, uh, you know, it's hard for us to think of anything else because it's what we know, but uh, possible that there are other chemistries and other uh, environments where yeah, something uh, interesting could happen. And also, depending on what chemistry a life form has the Goldilocks zone will shift drastically. In fact, in fact, the Goldilocks zone uh, is, 
it, now that we're seeing liquid water on moons of Jupiter and, and the outer planets, uh, the Goldilocks zone looks a, a lot broader than uh, we tend to think of it. Yeah, in special circumstances, yeah. Well, that's where life was going to start. I, I think. I guess the the special circumstances have to have a a, a duration of a, you know a, a billion years before uh, so before they can create life. But uh, maybe not. Uh, it, there's the whole panspermia thing. Uh, if the, if the panspermia argument turned out to be true, then you you know why not expect to find uh, life uh, under the ice. Uh, on Titan. Uh, or the well, corollary I, is in the upper atmospheres of Venus. Yes. Yeah, I like that one too. What is the Goldilocks zone? It's the zone where conditions are suitable in terms of temperature and various other mm -hmm. things to support a life form that is based on a particular chemistry. In it's, other words, well, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. That's the, same right. thing, the same thing <laughs> the bear <clears throat> the bears wanted in their right. porridge right. Uh, okay no it's what so it's would... what goldilocks wanted <laughs> okay yeah <laughs> so that would be earth uh, that's us We're, yeah that's right you know it, it's a very uh, earth-centric view of the of of, uh, of, of life yeah. there was what? a lot of writing um back when i was in uh, grad school about some of the constants uh, in the in the universe and what would happen if there were very slight changes in the values of of some of those numbers and I can no longer remember what they were because I don't remember enough of my physics. Charlie oh. probably knows. Well, I mean, one of the one of the classics ones is that there is a nuclear energy level in the carbon twelve nucleus, which, if you shifted it a little bit, uh, we would not uh, we would not have be able we would not be able to produce the elements that produce the Earth that produce us. You know, there's there are there are some places you go and you sort of what what is it when you do uh, you know operation not operations research but when you're doing uh, uh, when you're planning a large, complicated uh, under undertaking, you look for the, these uh, bottlenecks in the system. Well, there's, there's what's called sensitivity analysis, where yeah. what you do is you vary certain parameters and you see which ones make a difference. And some you find out make no difference at all. And others, just the slightest change yeah. causes uh, all sorts of things to, to change in the objective function. Yeah. So that, so so people people can point to some of those, um, you know. It, it's it's a miracle that we exist. Uh, in fact, if you look at the whole system all around you, I was I was swatting a fruit fly only this morning, and I was thinking, my God, the miniaturization here is fantastic. Look at this sucker. I mean, I can barely see it, and yet it can dodge me. How do you know it was a fruit fly and it wasn't a drone? Uh, well, actually, it was an extraterrestrial alien, but, you know. Amen. Well, after you swat it down, you'll know whether it's organic or inorganic. Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> well, I might, be it. It. Yeah. might be plastic. Might be plastic. We're going off into quite a few different yeah. uh, directions here. Well, I think Howard, yeah. has, Howard has pushed us that way. I mean, it's a great talk, Howard. Thank you. Thank you. You're kind. Thank you. Howard, can I ask you a quick question? Please. Um, where are these uh, telescopes pointing? Are they pointing all four pi? I think it is to radians, or are we looking just in our galaxy? I don't really know where they have been looking, but I would imagine they certainly started off here. Uh, I galaxy. know that some of the telescopes the galaxies in the rotation more incredible because they are so far away. Yeah, but you're looking for a signal, no matter when it was propagated. Uh, but if it's true for, for another galaxy, it's less likely we will sense it. It's, our galaxy is large enough that a signal well, would be so attenuated. I mean, we now have, yeah, we now have you're, still, you're still looking for life somewhere. You don't care where it comes from. Right, but you have to be able to detect it. What I'm saying is it's easier to look in our galaxy because it is closer and there's less attenuation of the signal. 
coming from our galaxy than coming from the Magellanic galaxies, which are further away, of course. Yeah, the signal wouldn't be as strong, but still. But, you know, right, but I, I really can't answer that question. All I know is they have programs of certain.